for the last time, um, yeah, I realized that I actually spent a lot of time in the uh, when I talk about what I'm going to do today. Um, but today, what we are going to do, we, we will try to complete the outline that I gave yesterday. Um, and hopefully, uh, today I will realize um, the promise that I gave you guys, given an MPS, satisfying some conditions, uh, prove that there exists a local gap Hamiltonian. Such that this is the ground. So this is the main goal that I try to achieve today. Um, of the last lecture, uh, we talked about transmetrics. Um, and we saw how to actually easily compute the uh, expectation values of local by, um, by using the eigenvalue decomposition of this matrix. We saw um, this guy is a matrix from these two legs to these two legs, or vice versa. We made an eigenvalue. Then we saw that we can actually approximate up to exponential accuracy um, the expectation value of local observables. Yeah, I always wrong, but so this is the right eigenvector of this matrix is the eigenvalue. This is the left eigenvector of the transfer matrix with highest eigenvalue. Uh, I think it's now it's correct. This is this is the right eigenvector <coughs> because if you act with this matrix. Uh, with the right eigenvector here, R S prime. These are orthonormal to each other. So you get delta S S prime. And you get R S prime with the eigenvalue lambda S prime. And same from the similar from the left. Um, this mention is that uh, we have another condition as well, right? So the, the we want our quantum states to be normalized. Um, so what's this expression? Psi, psi, um, basically this guy. Well, if you read it in this way, it's the inner product of psi and psi bar. But if you read this expression in this way, um, it's basically trace of e to the n or e matrix. Is that you you take this transfer matrix and you multiply it by itself n times. So this is equal to E, this is equal to E, and so on. So we want quantity to be equal to 1. In terms of values of this matrix, um, it means that we want lambda s to the n. So sum over s, lambda s to the n, to 1. <clears throat> uh, 
And assuming the gap um, between the first and the second largest eigenvalue, uh, most of the contribution to this expression, this, um, expression comes from the first eigenvalue. Uh, other contributions are exponentially small. So when n goes to infinity, we can effectively take lambda 1 equals 1. Um, so we rescale all the eigenvalues by just modifying this local tensor A. And we make this equal to 1. And others are, you know, we modify by just rescaling all these eigenvalues. So eventually, it won't be exactly norm 1. But when n goes to all these values, uh, 2 prime to the n, lambda 3 prime to the n, they will be exponentially small. So they will be almost 0. <coughs> right. We can put this matrix in this form. But who knows, right? So given an MPSA, a local tensor, uh, can we actually play this game always? Um, and now uh, we will prove a theorem that basically tells us um, given, an, uh, given a local tensor MPS, given an MPS local tensor A, uh, what's the canonical form? So we bring uh, these tensors to canonical forms. Okay. Uh, before diving into the theorem, I also want to show you guys uh, that some potential decay of correlations. And what do I mean by this? Uh, the right. So yesterday and today we saw how to compute expectation of local observables. Uh, it's almost equal to this expression. But um, how about we want to compute So sometimes it's also called two uh, correlation functions. And eventually we will compare this expression uh, to this expression. So O1, X1. So these expressions we already compared. Uh, almost equal to this. Now let's compute the expression. Uh, so we apply that we made use uh, for calculating the expectation value of this. We replace um, this transfer matrix, each of this piece of this matrix model, by its eigenvalue. And here, this whole thing, now, right. 
right? So I decompose each of these transfer metrics in this way, and I multiply x2 minus x1 of them. And for the other part, from here to here, Ah, uh, yes, x1 is the position, is the label of the position of this operator. So, so this is the first qubit, let's say. This one is the second, and so on. So position of, um, yeah, so O1 is a local operator. It acts like an identity everywhere, except position x1 and x1 plus 1, let's say. And O2 is a local operator that acts like identity everywhere except uh, x2 and x2 plus 1. <coughs> so uh, it's now sum over s prime lambda s prime to the n minus x2 minus x1. Well, maybe minus 2 or minus 4, because, yeah. Uh, less prime. Put these expressions here, and for the remaining part, we get the following. So sum over s and s prime. Um, here we have l s prime. We have r s, l s, and r s prime times lambda s to the x two minus x one to the n minus x two minus x one. Now, assuming that our largest eigenvalue is, um, is of value 1, um, this expression equals this guy with the first eigenvector, L1, R1, L1, R1. plus uh, plus all the other eigenvectors, all the other that we have in this expression. But now with, uh, with these factors, exponentially decaying factors. So since we have only finitely many of them, we assume this bond dimension D to be finite. Um, the contribution to this, uh, this correlation function, this expectation value, mostly comes from the first expression. Mostly comes from the first term. And the second term, they are all exponentially decaying. Uh, with between these two operators. So when O1 is close to O2, maybe there's some meaningful contribution that comes from the second term. But if the distance between the first operator and the second operator becomes large, uh, then this contribution decays exponentially with the distance. Uh, so this is not exactly equal to this, but it's close to this. So all these two-point correlation functions, um, 
or they're actually exponentially small. And this is what people call uh, exponential clustering. Or sometimes exponential decay of clusters. So in matrix product states, uh, whenever this condition is satisfied, you have exponential decay of correlations. And also whenever you have finite Right. Um, but not every MPS satisfies this property. So now let's look at <coughs> how a generic MPS look like in its canonical form. So this is translation variant, uh, periodic boundary condition, MPS canonical form. <coughs> OK, so yeah, the term looks a little bit cumbersome, but it looks very similar to what we did yesterday for open boundary condition MPS, right? So remember, we have a state, quantum state, and we, find, we found its uh, MPS representation by successively Schmidt decomposing um, and expressing it as an MPS. So it looks very similar. Um, so given the uh, translation variance MPS on a circle, this just means that we use the same local every site. So we take a tray, slag and over it. So we put our MPS on a circle. That's what it means. <coughs> so we are, we are given an A. Uh, we will prove that. Um, each of these AIs can be put in this matrix. So each AI is by definition a big D by big D matrix. Um, so in general, this is a complicated D by D matrix. But by, by a, uh, applying some manipulation that follows from the properties of the CP maps, we can always put uh, this local tensor into this form without changing the state. So we express the same state with another local tensor, which is in this block diagonal form. Um, and this is what we will call the canonical form. So each of, each of these blocks this is a D2 by D2 matrix, and so on. So it's very, very similar to putting a matrix into Jordan canonical form, or putting matrices in, in block diagonal form. But somehow we, we have to do it simultaneously. So for each i, for each given physical index, it's a it's a matrix. So we have d of these list of these matrices, um, and the, the the aim is to um, modify this matrix to put it in a canonical form in such a way that the state that we describe is not going to change. We describe the same state. Um, OK, and, and there are also some conditions that these guys satisfy. And they look very similar to the conditions that we saw yesterday. Uh, each of these local tensors in this, in, for each block 
satisfies these properties. Um, and pictorially, this looks like this. And secondly, um, there's a fixed point of the transfer matrix. OK, let me first write it. Uh, where this guy is diagonal, positive, and full rank, full rank in DJ by DJ matrices. So within each block, uh, there exists a diagonal positive full rank uh, left eigenvector of the transfer matrix. So pictorially, it looks like this. So if the statement is clear, uh, we can start proving it. Here, uh, we have to observe one thing, uh, and it's the following. So this, this map uh, acts on matrices like this. And it's in the form of a CP map. So it's, it's a cross representation of CP maps. So we can see this as E acting on X as I. So this is cross representation of CP maps. And one important property that we are going to use is that it maps positive, um, positive matrices to positive matrices. Uh, that's, what's, that's at least one thing that CP map mean, means. It's a, it preserves positivity. Um, and there's always a positive fixed point of these kind of maps. So there, is al there always exists an X such that This CP map acting on this matrix X is equal to X itself. And we always assume that, uh, so you can also see this as, a, as an eigenvalue equation. This matrix acting on this vector giving us the vector itself. As we have previously uh, in the motivation part, we will always assume that um, so this eigenvalue is equal to 1, and this is the highest eigenvalue of this, this matrix. So all other eigenvalues are strictly less than 1. Why? OK, so in our case, we don't really assume it yet. Um, 
But yeah, there may be more than one x that satisfies this property. But the highest eigenvalue is, is equal to one. So it can be degenerate at the moment. And then it's, it's somehow obvious why we call this as fixed point. Because when you apply this map on x many, many, many times, you still get x, right? It doesn't transform to anything else, or it doesn't, uh, this eigenvalue doesn't decay. Uh, so you don't get a zero vector, but you always get x. So that's, that's what we call the fixed point of the CP map. Okay. So now let's assume that uh, x is a positive fixed point, which means it's a positive matrix with, with eigenvalue 1. We can always find our local tensor AI as AI x to the minus 1 half x to the 1 half. So this is just a redefinition of our local tensor. So if we define our local tensor in this way, you don't change the whole state. Because what happens is the following. So our original MPS was this. But now I'm redefining each local tensor by, by adding x to the minus 1 half and x to the 1 half here. x to the minus 1 half and x to the 1 half here. And so on. So given the guarantee that x is invertible, so it's full rank, uh, and since it's invertible, we can also, yeah, there's a unique inverse. So these guys just cancel each other. So this is equal to the original state A. So you may ask yourself, you know, why am I doing this trivial thing, right? I'm just putting, um, x minus x to the minus one and x to the one in between, they anyway cancel each other. So we describe the same thing. But why am I doing it? I'm doing it to to put our local tensor uh, into a form such that it satisfies our first condition. So how do we see that it satisfies our first condition? Basically, the first condition says that identity matrix is the is the positive fixed point of the CP map. So we start from a CP map uh, whose fixed point is some positive matrix X. And then we redefine our cross operators in such a way that now the positive fixed point is identity instead of X. And let's, let's see this. So now this is our new local tensor, X minus 1 half. OK, sorry. This is, yeah. Well, nothing really changes in this argument. So now, uh, now I'm writing this equation. So this was our new local tensor. <coughs> By definition, uh, this is equal to x. Because x to the 1 half times x to the 1 half times identity is x. But by definition, we know that this CP map acting on x gives us x. Right? Sorry, this is identity. So after applying this CP map here, uh, we, get, we get an x, but we have x minus 1 half here. So x minus 1 half times x times x, x to the minus 1 half is equal to identity. Of course, we are using here the, the positivity of x and its full rank property. 
Okay, so if if x is invertible, uh, then we can always starting from an MPSA, we can always put it in this. Right. And if we look at it from the left side, uh, it's again a CP map, but now. It's A, A dagger here. Sometimes it's also called dual, dual map. Uh, it's, it again has a positive fixed point. And by applying uh, now unitaries here, U minus one, U, U, U minus one. Uh, we can diagnose this, um, this positive fixed point. And it's again full rank, uh, assuming that, it, that it's invertible. So if the positive fixed points of uh, this matrix from the right and from the left is full rank, um, then we can always uh, modify this local tensor in such a way that it satisfies these properties. Right. W what happens? if this is not the case, right? So x may also not be invertible. And if this is the case, so if x is not invertible, <coughs> um, so what we first do is that we write this x uh, in its eigenvalue decomposition. So x being not invertible means that um, we can put it in a diagonal form, since it's a positive matrix. Um, but there will be zero eigenvalues. So some part of the, this virtual Hilbert space, um, x, x is only supported on the subspace of this whole virtual uh, Hilbert space. So here, alpha uh, runs from one big D prime, which is strictly less than D. OK, so now we want to show, I want to show you the following. Okay. So, so let's first PR be the projection. onto the support of x. So, so as I said, x is supported only in the subspace of, the, of this whole virtual Hilbert space. And let PR be the projection onto this subspace. And first, we want to show the following. So what does this mean? If we decompose, um, so if we hit with this projection from the right, um, for every i, this matrix gives us another vector on the left, which is again in this subspace. So we have to prove that uh, for all i, a i acting on alpha which is the element of the subspace. Um, OK, and for all alpha in R. So for all alpha in this subspace, if we act on it by AI, we stay in the same subspace. We don't go out of it. OK, how do we prove it? Uh, So let, let's assume that this is not the case. We will prove it by contradiction. 
assume star is not correct. Does it mean the following? So there exists at least one vector beta in this subspace, such that if we act on it by some j, some aj, uh, by the CP map, by the CP map, we get out of the uh, this subspace R. So we know that this is supported purely on this, this subspace R. And if we get out of it, and if we subtract them, we will have a negative uh, element on the diagonal. So basically, we will have like lambda 1, lambda 2, until lambda d prime. It's this part. And now we are out of the, out of the subspace, r. So this is r. <coughs> and now we have some minus lambdas here that come from this. OK. Uh, but now, um, this, this is x, right? This is the positive fixed point of the CP map um, that we also call transfer matrix. Um, so we could just replace this by the following. Lambda alpha. Um, sum over i, sum over alpha. Minus. So if you write down this expression, you get this. OK, there is no sum here. Lambda beta. <coughs> now, what's this expression? It is equal to sum over i, sum over all i, um, except j, and sum over all alpha except beta, because we are subtracting them. And it's lambda alpha. I alpha alpha. Now we have to observe two things. Uh, so what we are doing is the following: we are acting by another CP map. Now its cross representation is missing one term, which is the J term, but it's still a CP map. And now we are acting by this CP map on another positive matrix, which is not x, but the same as x, except instead of lambda beta, we have 0 here. Because that's what we do here, subtract lambda beta. Lambda beta, beta, beta. So here, this expression is equal to this. Uh, and this is nothing but CP map acting on a positive matrix. By definition, we know that CP maps acting on positive matrix matrices gives us po another positive matrix. So this has to be a positive matrix. But now we have a contradiction, right? We assume that this is uh, not positive. This is a negative matrix. But by using the some properties of CP maps and positive positivity of x, we arrive at the conclusion that this is positive. So it's contradiction, and we prove this fact. Okay, good. <coughs> uh, 
Now, um, I have to erase somewhere. Um, OK. Right, so, so you first go and find the um, which is the positive fixed point of this CP map. And you look at it. If it's invertible, you do what we did at the beginning. You just modify the tensors in such a way that they satisfy this. But if it's not invertible, it means that it's only supported on a subspace. And <coughs> this R is the subspace on which uh, this matrix acts non-trivially. Uh, yes, S fixed point. Yes, yes. Right. So now, uh, what does this tell us? This tells us that uh, we can modify our A in the following way. Okay, so R plus R perp is the full uh, full CD. So you should just imagine this as like this block is subspace R, and the orthogonal block is subspace R perp. Right. Um, and um, okay. So this basically tells us that in this decomposition, uh, we don't need, need to use PR, PR perp. Because whenever there is a PR here, there has to be a PR on the left. So what, I, what I'm doing here is the following. I, I replace this identity as a, project, as a sum of projections on PR plus PR perp on the left and on the right. So in the most general case, we have to have four terms, like PR perp, PR perp, PR, 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 PR perp, and PR, PR perp. But we don't have PR, PR perp because of what we have proven. So we modify our local tensor in this way. OK, but now let's look at the whole tensor. So what does this tell us? This tells us that if we have a PR perp here, so each line is basically equal to PR perp plus PR. Now let's look at the case where we have PR perp here. If we have PR perp here, it has to continue PR perp everywhere, right? OK, that's the first case. PR perp carries over to the right. And if we have PR, if we start with PR, we can continue in two ways. Having a PR here implies that we have to have a PR or a PR perp on the right. So here we can have PR or PR perp. Now imagine we have PR perp here. And by using the first case that we analyzed, it has to continue as PR perp. But we could also have PR and continue in the same way. 
So we could continue here with PR, right? But if we continued with PR up until to the end, since we actually trace this leg with this leg, it would give us zero because they are supported, they are projections onto orthogonal subspaces. So um, if we erased this term, we wouldn't change the whole tensor. It's because, it's simply because uh, we take the trace at the end because of the periodic boundary conditions. So we, we don't need this term. So we can modify our local tensor uh, to this. by not changing the state. Of course, here, if we didn't have periodic boundary conditions, if we had open boundary conditions, then we wouldn't be able to uh, erase this term, because this would potentially change our global state. But because of the periodic boundary conditions, we can put this local tensor into this form. Okay, so, so updating this local tensor into, in this way, uh, it means that now we modified our AI in such a way that it looks like uh, for all I, this is true for all I, each AI is a matrix that's either supported on R or our perp. And these are completely zero. This is R. This is R perp. <coughs> right. So we basically now did this. Um, yeah, this is the first step of obtaining this form. But of course, you, you can now iterate this procedure. So we, we did it from the right. Now you do the same thing from the left. And now from the right again and from the left again, until you get all your x's invertible. And when your x, so this is like iterate, uh, well, let's say step two. We get each AI equals. All the off-diagonal blocks we set to zero. And each block, um, we repeat step one. So step one, this is step three. Repeat step one for each block. Well, at the time that I was doing step one, I didn't call it step one, but it's the step that we did, that we modified our local tensor by x to the one half, x to the minus one half, such that we have the first property. And now we also rotate, we also applied unit trees here, u dagger and u, so that's uh, the left eigenvector. Uh, is is diagonalized. Right. So 
So this is the end of the proof of theorem. Now observe that uh, now each block has a positive fixed point, and we uh, this positive fixed point is equal to identity. <coughs> yes. Okay. Any questions in for this theorem? Yeah, it was a long. But you know, if you look at it locally, step by step, it's uh, yeah. Right. Okay, but now, uh, yeah, where, where do I want to arrive with this? Uh, so this general form is actually. Um, is against to the assumption that I made, right? So uh, the assumption that we made is that this transfer matrix, AI, AI dagger, uh, has only one, one fixed point, right? We assume that there's an eigenvalue decomposition like this. And lambda 1 is strictly greater than lambda 2, and so on. But here, for each block, in principle, for each block, uh, we have an eigenvalue. We, we have a, we have a right, left eigenvector and a right eigenvector uh, with eigenvalue 1. So all these things that I told, told about, that I said about exponential decay of correlations, um, and so on. If we have the general form of this kind, it doesn't hold. Um, right. And now I will uh, introduce some which are that's correct. Um, Yes, but of which Hamiltonian? Yeah, but but yeah, that's correct. Uh, yeah. Um, right. So we we introduce conditions, and I will argue that conditions are what you will have generically. Well, one of them I already argued, so is gapped. So the, the way that I argued this is that if you just pick a random A, it's highly unlikely that it will be, there will be a degeneracy in the first, um, first eigenstate. I mean, and if there is, you just perturb it a little bit, and then you will destroy this form completely. <coughs> right. And the other thing is called injectivity. So let's first talk about injectivity. Um, now here we see um, okay, let's say that we blocked L0 of, um, of these tensors. So let's call this uh, a tilde L0. So it, it has two, uh, f two virtual legs, but it has L0 physical legs. So this leg, it lives in CD0, CD to the L, but these still live in CD. So now we see this tensor uh, as a map, as a linear map from the virtual degrees of freedom to the physical degree of freedom. 
So I'm here, uh, yeah, something that we never did. Now, the inputs of these, this linear map is, are the virtual legs and the, the physical leg. And we call uh, A tilde L0 is injective. If and only if the span, okay, maybe I should, yeah, I mean, it's not going to matter too much, but let's see this as a map from physical to virtual. The span of um, this guy. Um, is equal to the full matrix algebra on the virtual leg. So what does this mean? It means that by so so this is a tensor which is a map from physical freedoms to the virtual degrees of freedoms. Um, and by putting a vector here, you generate a this level. Actually, what, yeah, what, yeah, sorry. I mean, we, we could also see this as in this way. It's a map from these legs to the matrices on the virtual leg. Don't see it in that way for this uh, discussion. See this as a way of, it's a map from a vector on the physical leg to a matrix on the virtual leg. Okay? Yeah. So by, when you input a vector here, when you contract this map with a vector here, you get a matrix on, this, on the virtual level, right? And by changing this vector, you get another matrix. Injectivity says that um, you can basically generate every d by d matrix by inputting another vector on the physical leg. Right. Th that's also what somehow injectivity means. It's like for every vector on the virtual leg, there's a corresponding vector in the physical leg. So you inject the vectors in the virtual leg into physical degrees of freedoms. So th there is no vector here for which there is no corresponding vector on the physical leg. Why you apply this, this map? So this is what injectivity means. Um, And then you ask, you know, is, is this correct for every A? So given an A, is this really correct? Um, and it's actually not, right? If we look at, if R A I is in this form, in the canonical form, uh, then if we put a metric, It's going to be annihilated by this by this map. So if you put an X here, it's going to be annihilated because this A maps. Um, so th this guy, this whole guy, for every physical index, it maps each block in itself, and if is this X sits here, annihilated by this matrix on this, under this contraction. Yeah, I'm not doing a good job explaining this at the moment. Um, so this AI, for, for all A, it either, yeah, so it, it maps PR to PR, or PR perp to PR perp. This whole matrix algebra, there is a matrix that maps degrees of freedoms from PR 
to degrees of freedoms from PR perp, or vice versa. So it sits here. And if you put a matrix here that maps a PR to PR perp, it's annihilated. So this general form actually is not injective at all. And for injectivity, uh, you have to have only one block, full one block in the canonical form. So injectivity implies one block. And again, why is this generic, right? Uh, because it's definitely not the general case. But if you pick a random A, uh, after blocking this L0 many times, now this is a map from uh, D to the L0 dimensional Hilbert space to D square dimensional Hilbert space. And if you, you pick a random matrix, uh, It's basically supported, its image is supported on all D squared dimensional Hilbert space. So generically, we have injectivity whenever uh, this Hilbert space is bigger than D squared. I mean, this, this has to be bigger than this for, for the possibility of injectivity, because otherwise you have less vectors, and you are trying to inject more vectors into a subspace, into a space that has less vectors. But whenever this is bigger than this, um, then generically you will have injectivity. So when you block L0 greater than log D squared, over log D sides. So this is the argument for we have for injectivity property. Uh, so when we re redefine our local tensor by blocking it L0 many times, which is greater than this expression, then we will have this property, this injectivity property. Um, yeah, let me repeat again. Injectivity means there exists a corresponding vector here uh, for every vector on the virtual leg, for every matrix on the virtual leg. And the other generic condition that we have is uh, the assumption of E is E being gapped, um, which means that it has only one block with uh, only one, eigen one highest eigenvalue one. So all other eigenvalues of this transfer matrix is less than one. <coughs> and the argument here is really that whenever there is degeneracy, you can break it. Degeneracies are highly unlikely. Or to say in more mathematical terms, it's measure zero in the, in the whole subspace of, of these kind of uh, matrices. <coughs> it's, that's, yes. That's correct, yes. Right, so you, using injectivity, we will um, build a local Hamiltonian. And also, then using this condition, you can prove that it's gapped. Right. Okay, good. <clears throat> so, I have 20 minutes. Yeah, now let, let me define parent Hamiltonian.
Uh, here is the definition. So, f okay. F uh, first of all, we assume injectivity. Okay, by the way, yeah, yeah let, let me give you your first homework. Um, prove that if this is injective for L0, then it's injective for all L greater than L0. So once you reach injectivity, it's always injective. By putting more local tensors here, it's again injective. Um, you have to use this property. Like it's a hint. OK, so we assume injectivity. We re redefine our local tensor by blocking uh, L0 of these local tensors. Um, so this is d to the L0. <coughs> and now we want to define a two local Hamiltonian. Actually, be careful here. Okay. Uh, such that it's the projection onto the subspace um, yeah, let, let me write it in words. onto the subspace. of um, onto the subspace orthogonal to the image of a tilde L0. So first of OK, and then this, the whole Hamiltonian is sum over i, h i, i plus 1. So inject tells us that uh, we basically inject all possible vectors on the virtual leg into the subspace on the physical leg. So there is some part of the subspace um, onto which this map is not able to uh, map. S because of this property, H i i plus one acting on uh, acting on our MPS is equal to zero. Right. Because H i i plus one is the projector is defined with the projector onto the orthogonal subspace on which our local um, our state is supported. So by definition, if we act by this local Hamiltonian term on our MPS, it gives us 0. And since uh, it's a sum of projectors, uh, this, is, this is a positive operator. So really, locally, uh, our MPS is, is the ground state of these local terms. Right. So in, you know, in the pictorial representation, this is our MPS. And here I act with an H this is equal to zero. It's just annihilated. Because this is a projection onto the subspace orthogonal to, locally orthogonal to, the, to our MPS. But now you can ask, uh, OK, it's great. You write this Hamiltonian. And this psi uh, is the ground state of this Hamiltonian locally. But maybe there is another MPS, which is also the ground state of the same Hamiltonian. Right. So now we want to prove that uh, this MPS 
is the unique ground state of this Hamiltonian. Okay, let me not state it as a theorem. So you want to prove that this A is the unique ground state of H parents. I mean, note that this is not an arbitrary Hamiltonian, right? way that we define this Hamiltonian is by using these local tensors. So this Hamiltonian is special to these local tensors. Okay, now, uh, so let's assume that R phi is um, ground state of H i, i plus one. Okay, let's do H one, two, and H two, three. And let's say we have four sides. Um, well, let's say we have three sides. But we still didn't check for H13. Not yet here. I will do it for three sides, but you will see that it's, it's generalized to n sides by construction. So now this phi. Uh, is in the intersection of the following subspaces, following states. Okay, by the assumption that this phi is the ground state of H12, we know that our local tensors here are, are given by A and because that's how we con constructed H, I, H uh, the local Hamiltonian term. And also, the promise that we um, are in the ground state of H23, this phi has to be in this form. Like an arbitrary tensor here, but there has to be local tensors local tensor A on the second and the third side. Right. But now, um, OK, basically, we want to find possible Y and Z such that this is equal to this. Having the same state, right? phi is in this form, but phi is also in this form. So what are the possible y and z's such that phi is both in this and this form? Well, injectivity implies that there exists a map acting on here. Such that we can actually invert this vector and find the corresponding vector on the on the virtual legs. So this is equal to this. Right? Because for for every vector on the virtual legs, uh, there is a corresponding physical leg. This is injectivity. It means that we can invert it back. Now, if we apply this here and here, the left-hand side becomes um, becomes this, 
right here. What I'm doing is that I replaced this with this left. Um, wait, what's happening here? Okay. Okay, I, I should have done this with four legs, actually. Uh, sorry for this, but uh, okay. Let's do this. Okay, and then... Right, right, right. Okay, let me actually check why this doesn't work. Well, you, you need at least two of them so that you invert these guys um, and you get this kind of tensor here. And when you invert these guys, you get this kind of tensor here. And then you can invert further by using this. And this becomes this guy. Um, this would imply that Z, uh, the, the Y, this form. Why. Okay, the, the proof is actually has been a little dirty uh, because of a detail that I skipped in the, yeah. But what you basically do is that by using injectivity property, um, you find that every boundary vector, uh, every possible boundary vector looks like um, the local tensor A with some um, with some tensor on the virtual leg. So the ground states. So injectivity implies that Hamiltonian ground states are given by. this set of vectors. So it, it all looks like um, the original MPSA, but you can actually put um, any boundary tensor X here. So we still don't, we still haven't shown that. This is the unique ground state of the parent Hamiltonian. Um, now again, using injectivity, let's show that. Um, okay. So the condition one, assuming injectivity and translation invariance, we could basically put this x anywhere on the lattice, right? Because this position has no uh, priority with respect to other positions. And by injectivity, we know that we can actually carry this to an other position by a different uh, tensor. 
So this is equal to this. So for any given x, without changing the state, we can carry it uh, to another part on the lattice, to another virtual leg on the lattice. And then, again, using injectivity, we know the following. Uh, by contracting a vector here, we can generate any element on the matrix algebra on the virtual leg. So which, in particular, means that we can generate identity. And it means that x is equal to y. Right. So we here we are imagining the particular vector that generates identity uh, in this direction. And since this is true for for any vector that we put here, we can generate identity. So x has to be equal to y. But again, you injectivity again. Uh, we know that we can generate any matrix in this matrix algebra. So this x actually commutes with every matrix uh, in this whole space, which means that by Schur's lemma, x is nothing but a scalar multiple of identity. And hence, we prove that since we show that x can only be identity here, and lambda has to be 1 by normalization, we prove that this is the unique ground state of the parent Hamiltonian that we defined. OK, so yeah, but please repeat these parts uh, by yourself again, because uh, since I skipped the detail, uh, didn't have time to, uh, to do it with justice. Um, right. And then uh, using the condition that this is gapped, one can also prove that the, the parent Hamiltonian is actually gapped. So there is a gap between the zeroth eigenstate, the ground state, and the first eigenstate, first exact state. It's a little bit more involved. Um, and if you actually go to the, the, the paper that I cited yesterday, that I referred to, by Perez Garcia, Fastrata, and Sirac, um, uh, and probably also by Wolf. Yeah, maybe, yeah. So there you should go to section 4.2. Um, and they refer to another paper from 1992 when they actually proved the gap. So, so if you wanna, if you wanna learn learn more about how these parent Hamiltonians are gapped for 1D MPS under the condition of injectivity and and this assumption, uh, you should check this part of that paper. Okay, so let me also quickly talk about uh, classification of phases and how it's related to, to what we are doing here. Um, uh, this will be really short, like five minutes and then, yeah. So I'll just give the idea of how the, the transfer matrix is actually the key in classifying uh, quantum phases. So th the problem is actually very general. Um, you are given a Hamiltonian H and another Hamiltonian H prime. So how do we distinguish them? You know, we are, we are given a system, we are given two physical systems. Uh, maybe they are not exactly the same, their microscopic details are not exactly the same. Um, but maybe there are some long-range observables or, or macroscopic observables or some correlation functions that distinguishes them. Um, 
So people, people defined uh, the phases by, by a notion of equivalence class. So a Hamiltonian H, another Hamiltonian H prime, is said to be in the same phase or in the same class of phase uh, if there is a continuous part of Hamiltonians between them, some HT. in such a way that you don't drastically change any long range observable, any correlation function that, that are separate from each other. Um, and this is equivalent to uh, HT is gapped. It's local and gapped. So you start from a gapped Hamiltonian, like local gapped Hamiltonian, and you deform it, and on the way of deformation, you keep your Hamiltonian local, and it's still gapped. If this is the case, H and H prime are, are said to be in the same equivalence class of uh, physical phases. Is, is it may also change the dimension of the Hilbert space, but for now, let's keep our physical system the same. They are all supported on CD tensor N. But in principle, I mean, all these notions, especially being gapped, make sense when N goes to infinity. So. Right, you have to add more ingredients. Like, you have to tensor product, product states. Then you enlarge your Hilbert space. And then you can still do this. Um, right. But instead, uh, one could also, you know, he, he, here is very detailed because what you do here is uh, you basically have to think about the very big operator, and then you should really be careful about not closing the gap. Um, but maybe instead, we could look at the same problems in terms of ground states. So say this is the ground state of H prime, and this is the ground state of There is a gap. And you can, one can actually show that uh, if H and H prime are in the same phase, then there exists a um, finite depth locally that carries psi to psi prime, and vice versa. And if there exists a finite depth local unitary that carries psi to psi prime, um, then H and H prime are in the same phase. So being finite depth local unitary gives us the fact that we keep our Hamiltonian local. Because if, if, you change, if you change your state by a unitary, you change your Hamiltonian by h u dagger u. And if this u is finite depth local unitary, then the locality of a only spreads uh, like a light cone. So it can only, if it's local to b, it stays local. Um, and if you are given the promise of gap at the beginning, then this preserves the gap because you just redefine your eigenstates. You don't change their energies. And this is what um, MPS is particularly suitable for, right? We don't deal with Hamiltonians, but we deal with states, and we try to classify the states. So we try to understand uh, which which MPS states are equivalent to each other uh, under finite depth local unitary. So we won't be able to uh, go into the details, but here are the results, mostly by, by Xie Chen and her collaborators like uh, Xia Yong Wen, Zhang Chen Gu. Is like this is like first set of people the other set of people are, are Norbert Schuch, Ignacio Strack, David Perez Garcia, Ferstrate, and so on. So
So what they found is that uh, in one dimension, if we don't care about the symmetry, no global symmetry, then there is only one face. So which means that uh, everything is equivalent to a product state. You can carry any MPS by using finite depth local industry to a product state. So no, nothing interesting happens in one dimensions. Of course, here we use MPS with finite bond dimension D. And the way, of the, the way that they prove works in the following way. Um, so this MPS A is actually uniquely specified by its transfer matrix up to local unitaries. So this is something called uh, fundamental theorem of MPS that we didn't have time to cover. But basically, if you know E, the transfer matrix, um, you can derive A out of it. So you know this matrix. What you do is that you make a singular value decomposition from here to here. And you obtain this guy. And you just declare this part AI, this part AI dagger. And when you block many of these E's, E to the N, or L0, you reach to a fixed point. Right? We already showed that this is exponentially close to E0 which is nothing but the right eigenvector here and the left eigenvector here. And from this, the local tensor A that you get is nothing but square root R square root L. So at, at the fixed point, the state that you get, the MPS that you get, looks like this. Square root R, square root L. Square root R, square root L. So it looks like a product state. Of course, the state doesn't need to be in this form, but it's finite depth locally unitarily equivalent to this state, which is a product state, right? That's why people call it a trivial phase. So there's no entanglement. Well, I mean, technically, this is the side. So there's still entanglement. So this is one side. But it's short-range short entangled and short-range correlated, which means this part, this left part of this side, is only entangled to the right side. It's not entangled anymore uh, to the other part of the system. So there's only short-range entanglement. And then the second result is that if you require some global symmetry, it means that when you make this deformation, you are not allowed to do deformations that breaks the symmetry. So if your Hamiltonian has this kind of symmetry, you say that these two, two Hamiltonians are in the same phase. As long as there is a symmetry respecting part, which is local and gapped. Of course, this refines the classification, right? Because now you require the symmetry. And then people there found, by again using the techniques of MPS, is that the phases, um, the 1D phases, under the global symmetry, is characterized by the second cohomology class, uh, where they use the projective representations. Um, right. So I think this is a good point to end uh, uh, this part of the lecture. And yeah, you guys should check these papers. Uh, and we can actually quickly do it. So if some of you are interested in seeing how to classify these phases, it takes like 20 minutes or something. So we can. We can do it separately with a set of people who is very interested in it. OK, thanks a lot. So we have a two-hour break before the colloquium. Uh, that's two. And then, uh, so at four, as usual, there's the afternoon session, second, second lesson of, of today. OK? <coughs> Okay, sorry, yeah, this could be